few logistical things. So the Kaggle competition is up and running. Uh, the homework assignment was due, but we still have slip days, the project on kernels. And the next project will come out on Monday. That's the current plan. Or may maybe Friday. Friday or Monday. Then uh, we will, so I guess basically, you know, we had this, this um, you guys filled in the survey, how to improve the class. So I think the three main things were CMS, pushing the grades onto CMS, that's done. Uh, one thing people ask is, you know, making the homeworks more related to the project or more related to the course. So now the homeworks will have a very clear link to the project, certainly the next homeworks you will see this. And the last thing was recitations. And so we now actually do have recitations. Some, some people already went to the last recitation on kernels. And there will be one on Gaussian processes. So if there's still something unclear about Gaussian processes, please go to the recitation. The student giving it actually is he's writing his PhDs, in his last year of his PhD on Gaussian processes. There's few people in the world who know more about it than he does. <coughs> Um, okay, good. Then last time we talked about bagging. And bagging is a very effective way to reduce the variance of a classifier. And so we're using this in the, you know, in particular in the context of, of decision trees, because decision trees, if you grow them fully, are very high variance classifiers. And so the idea behind bagging is very simple. You have some distribution P from which your data is drawn. You don't know this distribution P, but you have this finite data set D. And so now if you train a classifier, this classifier has high variance. So what does that mean? It means that in some sense, you're worried that you, your classifier captures stuff about this specific distribution, like this, this specific data set D, that is actually not all that common in the distribution P. Right? So you're overfitting. So how do you combat that problem? It's quite simple. What bagging does is the following. You take this distribution D that has n, sorry, this data set D that has n data points, and from it you draw multiple data sets, D1 all the way to Dm. Each one has the same size as the original data set. And you draw them with replacement, uniformly at random with replacement. Okay, so the difference basically. If you draw on the replacement, you basically draw one point at a time, but you can pick the same point multiple times. Every single point is kind of drawn, you know, independently from this data set. And then what you do is from each one of these data sets, you now learn a uh, classifier H. And you train all of these. And then you're saying, well, my final classifier is just the average of all of these. So now you go back and say, my final classifier is just the average let's make this J. And that's it. And the idea basically is that let's say basically you're overreacting, right? Like you can kind of view overfitting as an overreaction to certain idiosyncrasies in your data set. Well, these will be all different in these different data sets, and they essentially average out, right? So that's basically the idea. And, uh, yeah? But aren't you increasing all of your training and your testing by a factor of n for the runtime? Oh, that's right, that's right. But you know what you do? You just buy m computers, you do it all in parallel. <laughs> So um, it's, it's actually true, by the way. Now that we, you know, computers are so cheap, a multi-core, every computer now has whatever, 16 cores at least, or something if you buy a desktop, right? It actually becomes very cheap to run things in parallel, right? So uh, in some sense, it becomes a, you know, a more, more appealing method with modern hardware. <clears throat> so the testing is, however, slower. That's, that's fair, right? The testing takes m times as long. But you get another advantage, and the, you know, one advantage is basically reducing uh, variance, but there's another advantage, and that is that now you actually get a very good calibrated probabilities. So one thing you can say is, you can actually, you know, let's say on average you predict a certain label, you could actually look into each one of these different classifiers and see how many of these classifiers 
have predicted that certain label, right? And that basically tells you how certain you are about your prediction. Um, all right. So let me, bagging is really, really awesome. I'll show you a little demo in a few minutes. One of the most popular um, instances of bagging is called random forest. And random forest is awesome. It's a really, really awesome algorithm. It almost, it was, at least the machine learning, it was almost forgotten. And then um, it came back big time. It was also invented by Leo Breiman. Leo Breiman was the same person who also invented bagging. After he was done with bagging, he also invented random forests. And uh, random forest is a very, very simple algorithm. It's basically bagged decision trees. Uh, but there's a very small modification. And so here's what you do. You basically, um, you take your data points, you take your data, uh, data set D, you draw the different data sets D1 to Dn, and now for each one of these, you learn a decision tree all the way to the end. Right? So basically, you keep splitting until you have zero training uh, error, or until you basically have two points that are identical and you can't split them anymore. Okay, so that's, you're really overfitting, in some sense, each one of these data sets, right? You're so confident that bagging is going to rescue you, right? Just, you know, driving, you know, you're going all in with the variance. And, in fact, you're going even crazier. You make a small modification to your decision tree algorithm, and that is, whenever you make a split, right before you split, currently what the decision tree does, it tries out every single dimension, and every single dimension it tries out every single split. What you do in random forest, you say, instead of doing that, I'm trying all d dimensions, I randomly subsample k dimensions, and I restrict my search to those k dimensions. All right, so basically, I build a tree, I take my data set and say, you know, d3 here or something, right? And then I split it in half, right? Or roughly in half, in two different subsets. This here is now my, my first node of the tree. But here, for this split, I split on some particular feature, f and some particular threshold t. So, um, you know, basically if x, f is greater than t, you go to the right, and otherwise go to the left. Here, I'm only considering k, where k is less than, k is less than, than d dimensions. And the reason I'm doing, it, uh, doing this is to make sure that these, data, these classifiers are all very different. So you're basically splitting on very different dimensions. <clears throat> and when you think about it, right, what's basically happening here is that because they are so different, they will make very different mistakes on test time. And now if you average them, the mistakes average out. Okay? And that is an extremely effective algorithm. Like random forest is one of my favorite algorithms. <clears throat> so just, you know, I'm not going to write down the pseudocode. It's on the notes uh, under random forest. Uh, but really, the, the important thing is that you only split, one second, only split on k less than d uh, features. And so, so the important thing is, for every single split, you sample k features afresh. Right? So it's not for every single Function, you, you have some features, but every time you split, right? So here, when you do this split, again, you pick k features at random, and you split on those, and then you find, uh, you find the best one, and then here you pick k features at random and find the best split. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, so what's the minimum number of, uh, like the minimum uh, value of d and the role of the sum in the data set? Like, 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 okay, actually, maybe, maybe this is, I'm bragging here. Maybe it's just less, not less, less. Okay, um, so it works for any kind of dimensionality. And so one question is, how do you set k? Right? So now we have an additional hyperparameter. And it turns out there's a very good justification that I'm not going into. Just set k to square root of d. And you round up. And that turns out to work really, really well in practice. And I've never really seen... That's basically a hyperparameter that's, that you don't have to tune. You just set k to the square root of d. Okay, and there's, people have analyzed this, and there's this uh, theoretical justification as why this works so well, but for all means and practices, you can almost consider it not a hyperparameter. 
Now, here comes the beauty. Here's the reason I love random forest so much. I mean, actually, I would say, oh, sorry, yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh, then you try out every single one. And for each dimension, you've tried every single split. And you pick the one that, that um, uh, minimizes your impurity. Okay. So this is just the normal decision tree algorithm. Right? You just, during that time, basically, you pretend that you only have these K features. Right? That's all. You could just, you know, if you were implementing this in Python or something, you would just take, you know, just, just only take out those K features. And now just call your splitting function. <clears throat> Okay, so one reason I love random forest so much is because it really, you know, it's one of the very few algorithms that works out of the box. Right? So when a practitioner comes to me, and it happens a lot, people say, like, oh, I have this following data set, I collected whatever, like, you know, samples of horses, and I did the following, strapped the following sensors on, et cetera, whatever, right? And I measured the heart rate and, and these kind of things. Um, they have feature vectors, they have, you know, they're totally different you know, units, et cetera, right? One is the gender of the horse, one is the age of the horse, one is the heart rate, et cetera, right? If you want to use most machine learning algorithms, you would have to make sure that these actually scale between zero and one, et cetera, that, you know, if you have to pre-process the, these features very carefully. When in forests, you don't have to do any of this, right? Because you're just splitting, so actually the scale of the feature doesn't matter at all. If you measure your height in, in centimeters or nanometers or feet, it doesn't matter, right? <clears throat> So you can just, most of the time, you can just take your data out of the box. And now comes the beautiful thing. What are the hyperparameters of random forest? It's k. Well, you know how to set it. Square root of d. You're done. Right? And you have m. Right? How many of these do you, how many of these data sets do you subsample? And how do you set m? Well, as large as you can. Right? There's no real, you know, it can't be too large. Because like basically, you know, you, you set it until you get bored. Right? You know, you keep training, and then at some point you just stop. <clears throat> and that's the only thing. So you can't go wrong, right? That's the, the only thing if you go wrong if you're too impatient. You said m equals one or something. But <clears throat> you know, typically m is a hundred or a thousand. You know, you know, it gets a little better as you know it's, uh, m gets larger. Like usually the error kind of but it plateaus, right? At some point there's no benefit anymore. Um, so it's a beautiful algorithm because it's so so easy to use. And actually, it's really, really amazingly good. So most of the time, like my rule of thumb is it's always the second best algorithm. Right? So if you basically, if you give, take some other algorithm that actually is tailored towards, you know, you know, and massage it very carefully and make the right assumptions, then you can do better. You typically, you can always do better. But it takes a lot of tender loving care to get there. Yeah? So how is the size of? Oh, they're, they're unrelated. So you choose M independent of the size of D. Oh, so, no, no. M can be, can be 10 million if you want to. That can be larger, right? M is just how many times do you want to subsample a data set, right? And so the important thing is each one of these data sets has the same size as D. You're not taking this data set and splitting it into M partitions. What you're doing instead is you take this data set and you sample a data set that has the same size, the same number of data points, but with a replacement. No, they're not the same because you're sampling with a replacement, right? So let's say I have, I have a data set that has you know, A, B, C, and I want to sample from that another data set that has three entries, right? So you toss a coin. The first one, let's say you get B. So you stick B in here. Second one, you stick, you know, just a coin, let's say you get C. Third one, you may get again B. All right, so then, basically, this data set is quite different from that one. And so that, that's the key. And because you repeat some data points, you basically give more emphasis to some data points sometimes, and other times you actually don't sample them at all. So then, uh, you know, you get this into different decision boundaries. Yes? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> sure, if you, you know, I said, yeah, if you can afford it, yes, absolutely. You know, but you may want to use that electricity for something else. You know, I know. Charge a Tesla with it or something. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is there any way to, like, for us, how to think about the classifier of a decision tree? What is an ensemble of a decision tree? What is the average of a decision tree? So, for example, if you, you're first split on one of the 
So, so, yeah, okay, good. This is a good question. So you're basically saying, can you give us some intuitions about how, what it means to average decision trees, right? And so think about the following way, right? I have a data set, and I have you know, some x's here, and some, you know, say some, some uh, well, how do I draw this? So it's hard in two dimensions, actually. Um, okay, let's do this one, right? And you could either split this way, and you're doing fine. Or you could split this way and you're doing fine, right? And if you average out, you're actually splitting out both ways, right? So half the time you're splitting this way, half the time you're splitting this way. So each, the first tree would say, all of this is positive and all of this is negative, right? Because you split this way. The second tree would say, all of this is positive and all of this is negative, right? But on average, what you get is the following. This here is positive. This year is negative, and this year is kind of, well, I don't, I'm not really sure about, right? And that's the neat part. It actually gives you uncertainty, right? So now if you have a test point here, you say, well, dead on, this is positive. Here, this is negative, right? And here, I'm not sure it could go either way, right? And so in higher dimensions, there's not exactly 50-50. Yeah. Good question. Yes, any more questions? Yeah? Yes, 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 random forest actually the, one of the most commonly used algorithms for feature selection. And basically what you do is, let's say, so what is feature selection? selection? Feature selection is the following task. I give you a data set, I try to predict something, and I want to know which features are most predictive, you know, which features are most important. And why is, that, why is that something that's interesting? So when I worked, you know, I used to work a lot with neuroscientists. And they, for example, one thing they did is, you know, one collaboration I had is they, they implanted, for example, electrodes into, on, on top of someone's brain. So they, they took the skull open, they opened the skull, put electrodes, a, fo a foil of electrodes onto the brain, and then they closed the skull again, let the person run around, you know, for a couple of weeks. And they, <laughs> and they uh, recorded, so they basically had, a, the people wore a data glove, and they recorded the finger movements and hand movements of these people. But by the way, sorry, these are not volunteers. These people actually, it's not my grad students or something. They actually, <laughs> these are people who actually had to get done, had, had the surgery done for other reasons. And so we basically used that. Um, <laughs> and they were, you know, we, we, I mean, they were very volunteers, but it's not that they're you know, just randomly cutting people's heads open. <laughs> so uh, these are basically people who had to get the surgery done. They had to get this, this, uh, these electrodes implanted into their brains. And so then we asked them to wear this data glove. And this data glove basically, recorded the position of any given finger and arm at any given time. And then the task that we looked into is, can we, you know, basically be recording the brain activity all the time? It's, oh, the motor cortex. So the motor cortex is the part that actually of your brain that basically, you know, uh, it, it commands your muscles, essentially. Um, and so the question was, can we predict, you know, finger movements just based on the brain signal. And you get a lot of, basically, brain signal the whole time. And it turns out you can actually predict it pretty accurately, right? So you can predict the hand movements, etc. And so what we could then do is we could actually then, you know, just based on the brain signal actually, you know, predict where the, the, the arm movement was. And then we could also ask these patients to then, for example, play some computer games where they just thought of moving a joystick. And that actually worked. And, but the, ultimately, the reason the neuroscientists really want to do this is because they, they were less interested in actually the application of, of brain-computer interaction. What they were really, really interested in is which part of the brain does what, right? So they ultimately, what they really, really want to do is they want to figure out which part of the motor cortex controls your index finger, for example, right? And so they then basically, once we had the model that actually could, could make these predictions, they came back to me and said, okay, that's, that's nice, right? It's great that we could do this, but, you know, how, how does it work? Right? And so that's when you do feature selection. And uh, what you, for example, do is a random forest. And now if you have a, several thousand of these trees, what you look at is basically whenever you split on a certain feature, how much does the impurity go down? Right? So that's basically, and then you rank them by that amount. Right? And, and that actually is a very, very good signal that a feature is very important. Right? Because they, they, ultimately these random forests, because they're so random, right, they, they split on every feature eventually, because eventually they're always overfitting, right? so they split on the noise. But when they overfit, the impurity goes down very, very little. 
But the, you know, when they spit on a real signal, the impurity goes down a lot. Okay, so if you average that and rank the features, then actually you get very, very strong signal. And then what you usually do is you select like a very few features. These are basically a few electrodes and a few frequency bands in that case. And you retrain the classifier and you show that it still works. And then you know, okay, basically we found the region in the brain that does something. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, does, does random forest work really well in high dimensional data versus low dimensional data? Actually, it works as a surprisingly resilient towards the, uh, against the uh, course, uh, course of dimensionality. And in some sense, because you never really compute distances in a high dimensional space, different than, for example, the RBF kernel, etc. So uh, it, it gets slower in high dimensional spaces, but it still works pretty well. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Any more questions? All right, so one more time. Random forests are so awesome because they, they're extremely, you know, are the most out-of-the-box classifier that I know. Right? They only have two hyperparameters, and I can tell you exactly how to set them. Right? K is square root of D, and M is as large as you can afford. Right? So maybe a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand. And that's it. Right? Um, so keep this in mind. There's actually... Uh, there's one additional advantage. So that's one advantage. It's very easy to run. You don't have to pre-process the data. And there's a last advantage, and that's the killer advantage. And that actually is an advantage that every bagging algorithm has. And it's called the out-of-bag error. So remember when we did model selection before, what we did is we took our data and we split it in training and validation. Okay? <clears throat> and so let's say you want to you know, develop some system, et cetera, and you, you know, in order to know, or you're training a test, right? And in order to know the error, what you, basically what you do is you train your algorithm on this part, let's say 80% of the data, and then you evaluate it on 20% of the data, and that tells you how well you're probably doing on the test data set, you know, in, in real life, in runtime, right, on the true distribution, okay? The downside of this approach is that you have to only train on 80% of the data. Right? So that's kind of a pain setup. Turns out for random forests or for bad classifiers, you don't have to do this. You do not have to make a training validation data set split. You can actually estimate your test error directly on the training data set. Right? That seems crazy, but you can actually do it. Any ideas how we can do it? Called the out of bag estimation. Yeah? Uh, I mean, it's not an idea, but it's an opinion because all the, we have many data sets that are different, so we can, we can do that. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We have many, many data sets that are all different. So we can use it, we can, it's, it's like we can estimate the validation error on the terms that we don't have. Like, uh, yeah. That's exactly right. So what you do is you want to know what is the test error, right? And you want to estimate it on your training error. So here's what you do. So you go through all your training data points, and for every single training data point, let's say you have many different classifiers. H of x equals hj of x. All right? <clears throat> Each one of these was trained on a different data set, d1 to dm. All right? So here's what we can do. For every single training point, we can estimate the error, right? So what's the error? The error is just basically, you know, saying the loss, right? If you want to compute the loss, and that's just the average loss, um, you know, let's see here. Well, okay. All right, so if you have point x and y, then we basically actually compute the loss of x and y, which is the loss of the whole classifier. The whole classifier is already a sum of many different classifiers, so it's just the loss, you know, the average loss of all these different classifiers. And here comes the cool part. Some of these classifiers will not have had that point x in their data set. Right? So if I have one particular data point xi, yi, that will not be included in all of these data sets. Right? Does that make sense? So when I sample this data set with replacement, in expectation I get around 60% overlap with the original data set. And the other 40% are just repetitions of data points being chosen multiple times. Okay, for example, here I had this, this here was my D, 
this here is my D, D1 that I'm subsampling. In this case, I didn't subsample point A. Instead, I had point B twice. Okay, does that make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So what I do is for my point A, what I'm, what I'm choosing, I just compute the error only on those classifiers that were trained on data sets that didn't contain A. All right? And therefore, I basically took it out, right? Therefore, it was basically implicitly in the validation data set. And if your M is large enough, then it doesn't really matter if you just remove a few classifiers, right? Just make M twice as large, right? And then you're removing, your, you know, basically, essentially, for every, every single data point, you remove 40% of the classifiers, right? That works really, really well. <coughs> so maybe I can formalize this just a, a little bit. So basically, what I'm saying is my... My error rate, and I call it the out-of-bag error, is the following. I sum over all my data points to n. I guess I average. And then I def for each one of these data points, I basically sum over all the, the j such that xi, yi is not an element of dj. Right? So I take all the data sets for which xi was not in there. So I take all my data points, I go over every single training point, and for every single training point, I now go over all the classifiers, and I say I only take those classifiers that were not trained on that data point, and then basically I compute the loss of uh, that particular classifier, xi, yi, and I average that where zi, zi is just the number of data points, the sum of number of data points that um, xi, i just take a one here. So zi is just the number of, number of classifiers that were not trained on xi. Okay, this is just a normalization, so I just average them. That's all it, all it does. <coughs> Any questions? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. Okay, so this is extremely powerful, right? Because it means you train your whole classifier on all your data, and for free, you're getting an unbiased estimate of how well your classifier is doing on the test set. Right? This is super, super, super powerful. Right? It doesn't get easier than that. You don't have to be careful with your trained validations setup, etc. <clears throat> and you know, if you have a good implementations of, of random forest, you just spit that out right away, right? So uh, you know how well you're doing on your test set. Okay, any last questions about random forest? Yeah? Any specific kind of data sets that are not random forest? Uh, so, uh, okay, good question. So he's saying, is there any data for which random forests are not good? And so one thing, for example, in computer vision, if you take images, there are specific algorithms that we will cover next week, actually, that take into account that vision, like pixels are kind of co-located and have a very specific structure. And random forests don't really do this. They treat each dimension independently. And so um, therefore, they, they can probably never do as well as algorithms that take into account the specific structure of, of um, an image. There's of course other data sets where you, for example, have structured data, etc. So then, then it's also trickier. Yeah? What, about, what, is the problem? what is your problem with your regression problem? Uh, no problem at all. You just take regression trees. Yeah, yeah. It's great. It's awesome. Here's actually another thing, reason why it's so uh, good for regression is because random forests give you an uncertainty uh, for regression, which you typically don't get. If you do, you know, a kernelized uh, regression or something, you have to use Gaussian processes to get uncertainties, right? Which is like, uh, so, uh, so only Gaussian processes and random forests give you an uncertainty estimate for your regression value. Yeah? Um, for regression, would you still be dividing your leaves down until there's one point in each leaf? Yeah, okay, so you may, you, you would stop at some point, that's right. So yeah. you would introduce that hyperparameter. Yeah. There's actually one thing, you can improve random forests a little bit. If you, for each tree, so you build the full tree, 
and then you prune away from the bottom. Like you take each split and you see if that split does not improve my out of bag error, then I remove it. So you basically, does that make sense? You have the full tree and then you look at the last split. You know, any two nodes are basically 1.1 split. You say, does that split actually improve my out of bag error? They are those data points that were not in this, in my training data set. And if it doesn't, then I just remove it. So you kind of reduce the size of the tree. That help, tends to help a little bit. Because you're basically removing total noise splits. Yeah? Oh, if you basically compute the error um, across all trees. Yeah, it would probably be zero. It's not very interesting. Well, well actually, it's not entirely true, right? It, it's tr zero for all the trees where, on which it was included in the training data set. But for 40% of the trees, a training point was not included in the training data set. And for those, it will not be zero. No, 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 because you include, it will be lower, right? Because you're including all the trees that were actually trained on that particular point. Right, does that make sense? Let's say you tra 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 train a random forest on a, uh, uh, on a data set, and you take one data point that you totally mess up. You flip the label. It makes no sense, right? Only the trees that were actually trained on that particular data point will get that point right. Everybody else will get it wrong. So the out-of-bag error will be very high. Because whenever it was not in the bag, so in, in, that, in that data set, it will be wrong. But the training error will be right, low because 60% of the time it was in the training set, and therefore you got to write 60% of the time. So training error is not very interesting for random forests. Yeah. OK, good. Um, so here's one little, uh, oh yeah, one thing. I want to show you the bias variance demo that you all know. I can now do it with random forests. And so what you see on the X, this is the exact same demo that you've seen before, that you basically was on your project. And so what you see here is the ensemble size. The ensemble size is the number of trees that I'm averaging. And what you see here is the first, a few interesting things. So now I'm increasing the number of trees that I'm averaging. And the first thing, one thing you notice is that the bias is very, very low. Like if I have one, then it's just a normal uh, uh, standard decision tree. In this case, by the way, I'm not doing the random feature selection just because it's a two-dimensional data set. So square root of 2 is 1.4, rounded up is 2 again. So, um, so well, one thing you see, if I just take a little a single decision tree and I train it, you know, basically I have basically no bias, right? So the bias is basically 0. And uh, the variance is very, very high. So the variance, sorry, the variance is black line, right? Black line is the variance. The green line is the noise. It's a pretty noisy data set. It's the same data set that you had. It's basically two Gaussians. I didn't show the data set here. But it's two Gaussians that basically have some overlap. And I try to disambiguate them. Uh, and this here is the error, basically, of the whole thing. And it's basically, essentially, bias plus variance plus noise, which is exactly what the theory would tell us. Uh, so here's the beautiful thing, right? As the ensemble size goes up, one thing you can see very, very nicely is that, you know, the uh, the variance goes down drastically, right? Here we have 10% variance, right? And it goes down a lot, right? To 4%, right? And it keeps going down. But you also see this diminishing returns, right? So this here is my M, okay? So as my M increases, my variance keeps going down and eventually, eventually basically, you know, it plateaus, right? So it doesn't, doesn't change anymore, right? But you get a huge improvement here, right? A drastic improvement. And the... The amazing thing about bagging is it reduces variance, but it does not increase bias, right? Bias is unaffected, right? It should be very easy to prove that bias term actually is not affected at all by averaging the classifier, right? Can anyone tell me why? Yeah? You're just heading towards the mean. You're not moving the mean around. Yeah, but actually there's a very obvious reason. Yeah? That's right. Bias is not a function of H, right, of your classifier that you're getting. It's a function of the average classifier, which is unaffected in this case, right? <clears throat> so, you know, basically just having more averages of more averages, right? Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any difference. So, <clears throat> so the bias stays constant, but the variance goes down beautifully, right? And this here is just the fluctuation because I have small sample size. Okay, any questions? 
About this demo, does this demo make sense? <coughs> so I think it really shows very, very nicely that the, this amazing power of random forest. So, so please keep in mind bagging and keep in mind, uh, uh, mind random forests. They're really awesome algorithms. Okay, if there's no more questions, then we can move on. Last question, yeah? Oh, I see. Good question. They're very good question. So he's saying, what if you do classification, and I have apples and bananas, right? Those are my two class labels. And what I get is, at the end, 60% of the trees say it's apple, and 40% say it's a banana, right? What's the output? Uh, it's something in between. Uh, what you do is you pick the mode. You pick the mode, you pick the most common one, and then the ratio tells you the probability with which you predict it. Yeah. All right, good stuff. Uh, now comes random forest is pretty awesome. There's only one thing that's more awesome, and that is boosting. And today we do boosting. Question, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Can you apply bagging to any other algorithm? Can you apply Okay, good question. The question is, can you apply bagging to any algorithm? And the answer is yes. You can always bag everything. Um, it really helps when you have a variance problem. Like bagging reduces variance. So if you don't have a variance problem, if your training error you know, and the test error are roughly the same, essentially, it doesn't do anything. It just makes you slower, right? Um, but yes, you can, you know, people have backed all sorts of things. Okay, good. So boosting is, I would say, even more beautiful than bagging. It brings me to tears sometimes. <laughs> but it's also a little bit more complicated. So it's not quite as simple. But I think you can get it. So just, you know, just please pay attention. <clears throat> so. And sometimes boosting and bagging are very related. So both of these are ensembles of classifiers. So in, in bagging, we just said, you know, h of x is just the average um, OK? Let's put the 1 over n in here. And in boosting, you do the same thing. You say h of x is j equals 1 to n, m, and you just have an alpha here, an alpha t, uh, alpha j, sorry, alpha j of x. So it's the same thing. Right? You're also averaging many classifiers, but boosting goes the other way. <laughs> so boosting says, what if we have a very, very simple classifier that has really high bias? And so right now with bagging, we had basically low, zero bias, but really high variance. So we averaged out the variance. Now we're doing something else. We're saying, what if we have really, really high bias? How can we get rid of the bias? It turns out something very, very sim similar um, can be used. And actually, it started with a very famous question. And this was in um, 1988, Michael Kearns who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and is one of the fathers of learning theory, uh, he asked a very interesting question. He asked the question, can, if you have weak learners, which is very similar to basically high-biased learners, so weak learners are basically 
Classifiers that, if, you know, they can never learn, go down to zero training error. Can we combine weak learners, like if you, you know, if you have multiple weak learners, can we combine them to a strong learner? So can you, if you have a classifier that is so bad it can never get even tra zero training error, can we take multiple such classifiers and kind of, you know, construct like a, you know, a super classifier out of them? That then actually can get a zero training error on every single data set. Right? So that, that's the idea. So and that's called a strong learner. So back, back then, basically, people were convinced. But uh, you know, the quest, big question was: question was which classifiers can give you zero training errors and which cannot? Like which can learn something, and which cannot? And so he asked that question, and it was an open question. And uh, Robert Shapiro, uh, a few years later, he was a postdoc at the time. He actually uh, came up with the answer, very famously, and he came up with a proof. And it's really cool. So Rob is a, is a really nice guy. So he came up with this proof that actually showed that, yes, you can. And uh, the proof basically constructed some algorithm that you know, basically said, well, yeah, we can always make a, a, you know, combine bad classifiers to make a very strong classifier. But he was a pure theoretician, so he didn't even think of it very much as, you know, as a and he just, it was just a proof, right? But actually, uh, a few years later, you know, he basically realized, well, actually, we can actually make this in, in algorithm. And he had a paper that's called Adaboost. And this was a huge hit, right? This was published, I forgot which conference, but... Um, and it basically said, you know, if any one of you, right, have a shitty classifier, right, I have a way to make it really awesome. Right? And everyone's like, yeah, I have a shitty classifier, I just published one. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, it, it, it became a tremendous hit, right? Like, you know, suddenly everybody started using boosting. And uh, it has amazing theoretical guarantees that we will go over in the next, you know, I guess, two or three lectures. That can basically show that not only if you boost the classifier, will you always end up with zero training error, no matter how bad your classifier is. Even if you have really bad, you know, really bad bias, right? It's the simplest classifier you can think of. You can bring it down to zero training error. But not only that, you can bring it down to zero training error in a very small number of steps, right? in a step that actually is logarithmic with the training data. So it's, it's ridiculous, it's 30 of them, right? So it's tiny. <laughs> so very, very quickly, you know, you can turn, you, so it's an extremely practical algorithm, you can turn any kind of loose idea that you have, you know, you just come up with some algor algorithm that's not very good, right? You boost it and it becomes an amazing algorithm. <clears throat> and um, maybe I, what time is it now? Okay, so I set up the, the overall system, and then we will get, dive a little bit more into it in the next lecture. <laughs> and the, here's the following. So let me just call it, capital H is the classifier that I'm assembling. So let me call this here capital H. Yeah. Capital H is basically an average of many classifiers. Um, and these are all have high bias. They're not very good. But I would like to kind of, kind of make a, you know, um, Combine them into some really strong Frankenstein classifier. That's the idea. And so, uh, what we need to do is we, well, you know, the first thing we need is we need a loss function that tells us how well our classifier does. We've done this before. We just take any of the loss functions that we've seen before. For example, the exponential loss, the square loss, it doesn't really matter. And let me write the loss function a little differently. Let me say the loss function is now the loss function over h. I write this as a little bit of abusive notation. I'm saying it's the following. It's basically the sum of all the losses. One to n. Sum of all the losses over all the data points. Right, so that's that should be pretty clear, right? So basically, the loss. Basically, I'm writing the loss as a loss of a function, right? So I have a you know so I have a function, and I say the loss of that function is if I go over all my training data points and I look at the prediction and the real label and I compute the loss. And I average it, that's the loss of my classifier, right? And this loss function can be the square loss or exponential loss or whatever you like, right? Your favorite loss function. It can be the hinge loss, it doesn't matter. Okay? So here's the idea in some sense. The idea is this H is a sum of classifiers, okay? And so imagine I've already done a few iterations. What I would like to know is which classifier do I have to add, right? So if I now go from m to m plus 1, which classifier I'd have to add? 
Right? So initially, let's say I just have the zero classifier that predicts zero for everything. And so given that I already have some classifier, what classifier should I add? And so I can write that as the following question. Which little function h, right, this is this, out of the set of my terrible high bias classifiers, my weak learners, should I add to my h such that I minimize my loss? Right? So which function should be added such that I minimize the following function, h plus alpha times t, uh, h. OK, does that make sense? So this here is basically, this set here is basically my, my set of my sum of classifiers if I add one additional classifier to it. That's what I'm interested in. OK? And I'm trying to come up with a mechanism that tells me when you have a set of classifiers, which one should you add to it? OK? And once I have this mechanism, then I can just start with any kind of classifier, just a random, you know, and then I just keep adding, you know, use that mechanism to add classifiers to it. And that minimizes my loss function. All right? So this is what I'm trying to solve. Any questions at this point? Yeah? Um, this is for like M plus one position, right? Like, I, I can see how that's saying. If I already had M, I would add this one. So how would I do my first classifier? Oh, my first, yeah, you just take an arbitrary one. Right? Oh, actually, what you really do is the first classifier is the old zero classifier. So just, it gives you always zero. And then you basically start from there. Right? So this is kind of the base case. Yeah, but it's a good point. <clears throat> yeah? Oh, okay, good question. How does alpha come from? For now, let's actually not, so we will get into how to choose alpha optimally. For now, let's just say alpha is just a small constant. Okay, yeah, good point. We will, we will get into alpha. All right. Um, you know, here's what we do. We just stop here, but you got to promise me that next time you eat a lot of fruit before you come here and you're mentally alert and then we're going to go through it. <clears throat>